comes from the clarification of terms and in the Course, and it was kind of interesting that the little story with that is that when the clarification of terms came, it came originally in the original dictations, it was the first, it came at the beginning. Somehow, it got stuck at the back of the book, because I, when I read it, I went, oh, this would have been good to know, I think, easily put the clarification of terms at the beginning. But in there, he's saying, yeah, there, there's no free will in this world, there's free will in heaven, but what free will means is that God created us just like God. We have all the, everything that God is, God extended in creation, there was nothing withheld. And free will, oftentimes we've heard, what is God's will? What is God's will? And sometimes people will try to freeze that down into well, it's God's will for you to marry this person, or God's will for you to have a lot of money, or something like this. There's a teaching in the Course, God's will for you is perfect happiness. That's what God's will is, it's perfect happiness. And there is no perfect happiness in perception. Um, the closest you can come is the happy dream, or the real world, he calls it, or true perception which is the forgiven world, that's as close as you can come, but it's, even that will go too, you know, that will fall away because perception is temporary by nature. So, perfect happiness is God's will, it has to be heaven. It can't be that we can have perfect happiness with a perceptual world. It's just, we're, we're lifting the veil, is really all we're working on doing. So, again, heaven doesn't involve choice though, because if everything is perfect oneness and perfect abstraction, there's, there's nothing to choose between. You've got to at least have two to have a choice, and there is no choice in heaven. But in this world, atonement has to take the form of a choice, because when the mind, the ego made up the world of opposites, the Holy Spirit had to slip in the answer in a form that the mind could understand, because abstraction is completely incomprehensible to the mind that's asleep and dreaming. It's beyond the dream, actually, and there's no way that anything in the dream can actually convey what lies beyond the dream. So, it's just helpful, because I, I studied a lot of philosophy, and, and there was a big ongoing debate going on in centuries, for centuries in philosophy, which is called free will versus determinism. You've probably heard about it. <laughs> and, and ultimately come to the realization that, that, that there is no free will, and that everything, as far as the script's concerned, is, is actually destined. More than that, it's all the past, so you can't really break apart something and call it different names and do all these things that the ego does, it's just the past. Atonement teaches us that not only that the past is gone, but actually it never was, and that's, that's the healing. God's will for us is perfect happiness. No free will in the ego, but yet free will is God's will. So even some of the earlier prayers of the saints, like, like um, some of the earlier saints would use this helpful stepping stone idea, which is not my will, but thy will be done. That thy will be done is perfect happiness. And you still, you can see it's still a prayer that's saying, not my will, it's still identifying with the ego that there has to come a point where you actually go, Thy will is my will. And the only one that could actually realize that is the Christ. Because the Father and the Son, the, the Creator and the Creation share one will, and that will is free. So you see how not 
my will but thy will be done is just like a prayer of almost like um, when St. Francis, you know, said his, recited his famous prayer, um, which basically comes to an end with, towards, uh, that you must die to be born into eternal life. It still, it still has that egoic element, but he was really saying, die to the ego, in order to remember eternal life. And then Jesus, of course, is the example of, thy will is my will. I and the Father are one. There was no sense of a separate will. It was like the Christ and God had shared the will for perfect happiness. So you see, that's taking it really to the fullness of, of what it truly is. It's so different from this idea that, that human beings have, have free will. The ego made that one up. And it tries to pursue that one and pour all of its effort and energy into having its own autonomous individual free will, which is a construct. Actually, the prayer of St. Francis, that really, what you just said to clarify, e death of the ego, that really clarified that. Because that part quite, didn't quite make sense. To die, to be born to eternal life. Death, be ego. And it's it's even more of a you just are you're really exposing it as nothing. That's that's what that means. Because because the ego is nothing. So what is nothing can can't really die. It never lived. It couldn't even die. But it's just a way of interpreting that part of the the prayer from thinking that somehow death leads to resurrection. Where Jesus. He spends a lot of time saying, no, yeah. death is not the way to come to, into the resurrection. It, in fact, the resurrection had nothing to do with death. It's the resurrection of the mind. So I sometimes tell the story that within even the script of the world, you know, that you could say that the resurrection seemed to occur, it's, this is all just within the metaphor of time, before the crucifixion, people go, no, you've got it backwards. The crucifixion came first and the resurrection came second. But the resurrection of the mind came before Jesus' earthly mission. He realized, you could say metaphorically, who, who he was. The dove came down with John the Baptist before he called the apostles. And the dove landed on Jesus' head when he was in the river Jordan and he was being baptized by John and then that the dove comes down lands on his head and then you hear this voice from heaven this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased it's over for the ego already and the, the three-year mission hasn't even started and the ego is already out it's underfoot Satan is underfoot that Jesus doesn't believe in the reality of the ego this is still course a story, it's all metaphoric because we talked about the man was just a symbol, but, but within the story it wasn't like Jesus had to wait until he was on the cross, like one filmmaker made the last temptation of Christ and had him struggling and struggling and struggling and then even on the cross fantasizing about Mary Magdala and children and all kinds of things, it was a, one, one a filmmaker's depiction as if Jesus was battling with the devil all the way up <laughs> to the end, even on the cross. <laughs> He's still battling on the cross. That's not the way Jesus spoke those words, before Abraham was, I am. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. The, trend, the resurrection actually occurred three years before the crucifixion, if you use a time context, because that's why he was, those three years were used in such a dramatic way, healing the sick, raising the dead, and it was not human what was speaking through him. You know, the words, before Abraham was, I am, that was not a man speaking. It wouldn't make any sense for a man to say those words. It was, it was the Holy Spirit using the puppet uh, for three years, just as a, a demonstration. So. That's 
important to remember too, just in terms of if you start to think, well, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna get this till I die. That Jesus is saying, no, don't, don't wait on the resurrection. Don't wait on accepting the atonement till the body dies. It's not dependent on the body at all. It's a, it's a choice in the mind. And you can make it at any instant that you want to make it. It doesn't really depend on time. You, you know, it's not a matter of waiting. It's a matter of, of willingness and readiness and, and making the decision. And isn't that good news? That it's not time dependent or it's not dependent on the body at all. Just, for me that's just, it was even more incentive, like, okay then, let's get at it, <laughs> let's go. It's beautiful how the world reflects the, the desire of the mind, and so, as long as there's anything else on the altar other than God, it doesn't really matter what, and the altar being prayer or desire, as long as you or praying or desiring something other than God, then it's impossible to know our true nature and self. Because there's something that, that we would wish to be other than that. It says in the Course, Truth will be returned to your awareness by your desire, as it was lost by your desire for something else. So the defilement of the altar is simply to desire something other than heaven, as if there could be such a thing or other than God. That's what this crazy, tiny, mad idea, that's why it's called a mad idea. To, to desire something other than to live in the mind of God is mad, is madness. It's the definition of insanity and madness at the, at the core root. So it does seem that, that we're going through a purification, you know, that miracles are, are natural, they're, they're everybody's Right, but, but purification is necessary first, and we are going through a purification process, and that in the end, Buddha and Jesus both talked about emptying the mind. That really is the way, because as long, even with the Simone movie, at the end, you know, he goes through anger, depression, and frustration, and you know, at the end, he's ready to kill himself, he's actually ready to admit guilt. I did it, I strangled her, I bludgeoned her, you know, he actually, he snaps. It's almost like he feels the attraction of guilt is so strong. But it's easier for him to admit to a murder that he didn't do, than to face these intense emotions. And so, even at the end when it spins around and now he's, he's got, now he's got Simone as a partner and she's got a baby, and you know, the green screen is being used, it's still one more turn around. You notice he still had a longing for his ex-wife. You could see that in the movie, and, and his daughter, you know, wanting a chance to get back in there, and Kent was in the way. And then when Kent was out of there, you know, he came together with her, I want you back, and she said, I want you. But she had mixed feelings, of course, because she thought, Simone was still in the picture, but in the end, that final little turn was he still, he still wanted his wife, he still wanted his daughter, and, and, and then they brought in a, a baby, so the fiction continues. That reminds me a little bit of the Matrix trilogy where, okay, first Matrix, Neo realizes he is the one, but then in Matrix 2, you know, he seems to get caught into a special relationship with Trinity, <laughs> where it's like the one has forgotten. I thought, how, how do you make a Trinity after somebody discovers that they're the one? There's nowhere to go. You can't make a sequel, except the one expressing the one, but no, he's, he seems to be caught. And you can tell he's caught with Trinity in specialness, because toward the end of the second movie, you know, he makes it back to the architect, and the architect tells him the problem is choice. And yet, he's given a final choice, he's, the, uh, the door to your right leads back to the source, the architect says, and the door to the left leads back to Trinity and the Matrix. And guess which one he chooses, when he's given the choice between the source 
and Trinity in the Matrix, he chooses, he goes to save Trinity. He doesn't even give it a moment to prey on it. <laughs> he snaps for that choice, like, he snaps back at the architect, like, this is no choice for me at all. And then the next scene, right after that choice for Trinity in the Matrix, is he finds himself unconscious. The Sentinels have literally knocked him unconscious. And that's what happens when we think that we have to save somebody in the world, or that there's something that this world offers us. We come back for another round, you could call it reincarnation, like, I, I'm just betting, I'm thinking that this next time around, it's gonna, gonna be the one. I'm gonna, it's gonna work out. And then, that's what, that's what seemingly reincarnation is, just the belief or the attempt that you can work it out in form. You can save some person, some place, some thing, find it, and, and we can't. So that's why I always say, if you ever get that choice between the source and coming back to the matrix, remember your Course in Miracles training in that moment. <laughs> And take the Zor that goes to the source. Pray on it. That's right. Pray. <laughs> take a moment. Don't just react. <laughs> you know, just, just pray and, and take the door to the source. Well, when you said um, that God wants you to experience him now and not and wait, wait until um, you pass, I just, I just felt the love. This whole weekend, I felt so much love in this room. I'm so grateful for that. And when you when you said that, it just um, it just means a lot. You know, don't wait until the end. You can feel that now. Yeah. That's a great message. You don't have to wait. There's a group called um, Amana Shanti that sang the lyrics from the Course. Those who seek the light are merely covering their eyes. The light is in them now. It's in them now. Enlightenment is but a recognition, not a change at all. The peace of God is shining in you now. Why wait for heaven? Why wait for heaven? Heaven is in you, and you are home. So beautiful, the message. Shine.